Eddie, as you know, I have uh, focused on different theories of consciousness and written a large paper, Landscape of Consciousness, in which you're included in, in your views of perennial philosophy. But I want to ask a, a meta question uh, as mm -hmm. uh, someone with a scientific background, as well as interested in, uh, in uh, very spiritual aspects of consciousness. Is how, do you, how do you evaluate theories of consciousness? Robert, there are three factors that inhibit and any evaluation of theories of consciousness. The first one is the sensitivity of the individual. The second one is this whole question of theory, which is subsumed in intellect. And the third point is that the brain, the heart, the generative system are all part of the vehicles of consciousness. So let's quickly deal with sensitivity. We always have to draw on the great poets. Poets are the legislators of the human race, mm. which was said by a Cambridge professor of engineering. So, you know, yeah. important engineering professor. And uh, the example I gave is William Blake said that the tree that moves someone to tears of joy is just a thing to kick out of the way. <laughs> Steven Weinberg said, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it is pointless. <clears throat> when Monteverdi was invited by Galileo to look through his telescope, he didn't just see glowing gas, he saw deeper. He saw the spiritual being and composed his beautiful Vespers. So let's now move on to the whole problem of theory. To say how does the brain generate consciousness presupposes that it does in the first place. What question are you asking? Now, the problem with theory is this. All our logical deductions and definitions are partial and one-sided because, why? Because they are bound to the judging intellect and the particular angle of vision. So what people regard as a fact is merely one point of view. Hmm. The great Paul Brunton, uh, that was Lama Govinda, pointed out clearly that the intellect cannot prove the existence of God, nor can it disprove the existence of God, because the intellect deals with finite things. Whereas God, and I'm equating God in, in the sense of the universal consciousness, is not finite, it is infinite. So we need to use other means to understand God. Who put it more eloquently than the great Isaac Newton in the general scholium of his Principia, which I wish scientists would read, where he says that just as a blind man can't see co colors, we have no idea about our concept of God, then Newton says he is not eternity or duration, but he endures and he is ever present. So he is pointing to this universal aspect of deity. Yeah. Einstein, in his 1943 lecture in um, uh, America, yes, clearly said that we should not make intellect our leader. Einstein said it has powerful muscles, but no personality. It can only serve, it cannot lead. And therefore it is not surprising that this fatal blindness, as he puts it, is transmitted from one generation to another. And he refers to the intellectuals as the priests, the priests. Nasser, uh, was the, the tremendous Iranian scholar uh, um, uh, at MIT and Harvard, from a huge um, reading of all the great religious traditions, Christianity, Islam, uh, I mean, including Confucianism, Zoroastrianism, he said quite clearly that the physical universe can only be understood by the physical senses and the logical brain. But the reality behind that can only be understood by what he referred to as sacra 
sapientia, sacred science. Newton referred to it as prisca sapientia. Schumann referred to it as religio perennis. The same message gets through that the physical objective universe presents a veil, maya is the word in Sanskrit, and that veil of maya cannot be pierced by the intellect. And the failure of all our sciences to encompass the infinite in the finite is because maya exerts this spell <laughs> on those who would most deny her appearance. And finally, Einstein again pointed out the difference between true and really true. A, what appears is true, but what is really true is the, what's behind that appearance. The argument against that is that that's rationalization. That's a reason to uh, dismiss the, the materialistic physical analysis and that the physical, as a scientist, you can prove, you can do experiments, you can replicate, you can falsify, but everything else is just mysticism. Right. Physical science is vital and indispensable. M well, material, uh, materialist ontology is what we depend on for our physical existence. If you're constructing a bridge, uh, we have to have a, a materialist mm. ontology. Mm. The point is, thought and intellect are not to be dismissed, they are to be transcended. So the real is not opposed to thought, it is beyond thought, the horizontal dimension. It is not against thought, it is above it. So when you say that is all mysticism, I would again call on my friend Schrodinger, who said, not just as a throwaway remark in his book, What is Life? When he um, referred to our deepest sense, Atma equals Brahman, the personal self equals the all comprehending eternal self, he said the mystics of all cultures have said with one voice, Deus factus sum, I have become God. I have merged my personal self with the universal self. And when you say, Robert, that's only mysticism, who was England's greatest mystic? Sir Isaac Newton. Seriously. But Newton's genius was to mathematicize his vision and then put it down in words that we can understand.